Hello and welcome to this video on IFRS 15, Revenue from Contracts with Customers. The standard provides a five-step framework to recognize revenue from contracts. This video will be a good overview if you have never read the standard before and will also be a good way to revise the standard from time to time. Let's dive right in. The core principle, like I mentioned, is explained through a five-step framework. Let's say if you are an automobile distributor who sells trucks, and as part of selling trucks, you also sell annual maintenance services. And this is a bundle. Let's look at how IFRS would help us measure revenue from these contracts where you sell these trucks and services. The first and the most obvious step is to have a contract with the customer. Once you have a contract, the next step is to identify what is going to be sold, what goods and services are going to be sold. IFRS calls them performance obligation. So what's the performance obligation? Identify it. The next step is to say what will be the total cost at which these goods and services will be sold. And this is called transaction price. Identify what's the transaction price for this contract. Once you know what's the total transaction price, then allocate it to different performance obligations in the contract allocate the transaction price. And the last step is to recognize revenue. Recognize revenue when the performance obligation is satisfied. That is when the goods and services are transferred to the clients. A very quick recap, identify the contract, identify the performance obligations in the contract, and then determine what's the transaction price allocate the transaction price to different performance obligations and finally recognize revenue when the performance obligations are satisfied. The standard then moves on into each of these steps and provides more details. The first step being identify the contract with the customers. A contract is within the scope of IFRS 15 only when all these five conditions are satisfied. The first one is the contract is approved by the parties to the contract. Two, each party's rights in relation to the goods and services to be transferred can be identified. Three, the payment terms of the goods and services to be transferred can be identified. Four, the contract has commercial substance. And finally, it is probable that the consideration for the goods and services to be transferred will be collected. The entity is fairly certain of collecting money. The standard also provides guidelines on what the entity should do when a contract is modified. The next step is to identify the performance obligation. A performance obligation could be a good or service or it could be a bundle of good or service that is distinct. The standard further moves on to explain when a good or service is distinct. Coming back to identifying a performance obligation. It could be a good or service. It could be a bundle of good or service that is distinct, or it could be a series of distinct good or services that are substantially the same and have same pattern of transfer. We'll first try to understand the second point before moving on to the third. A good or service is distinct if the following two conditions are satisfied. The first one is customer can benefit from the good or service on its own or in conjunction with other readily available resources. The key is customer should be able to benefit from the good or service for it to be distinct. And a good and service is separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. The standard does give a few examples to explain when something is not separately identifiable and therefore will not qualify to be a performance obligation. Example one is when there is a lot of integration required between the good and service with other goods and services in the contract. Example two is when a good or service modify or customize other goods and services in the contract. And another example is a good or service are highly interrelated or interdependent with other goods and services. In all these cases, that is when a lot of integration is required, 
or the goods and service modify or customize other goods and services in the contract or when goods and services are highly interrelated or interdependent they are not separately identifiable and therefore will not qualify for a performance obligation so we looked at when a good and service is distinct a good and service is distinct when it satisfies two conditions i.e. the customer should be able to benefit from the good or service on its own or in conjunction with other resources and good or service should be separately identifiable moving on to the third option a performance obligation could also be a series of distinct good or service when do you call something a series of good or service in our very original example where we looked at a sale of truck let's assume we agree to sell three trucks and therefore three annual maintenance contracts to a customer this could be a scenario where there are a series of distinct goods and services so here each distinct good or service should satisfy a performance obligation and then a single method of measuring progress should be used the next step is to determine the transaction price. A transaction price is the amount an entity expects to collect when a performance obligation is satisfied. So this is the amount an entity expects to be entitled when goods and services are exchanged. So an entity will consider past business practices when it comes to determining the transaction price. For example, if an entity always gave a 5% discount on the recommended retail price, then only 95% of the recommended retail price will be booked as will be recognized as transaction price whenever there is a sale. The standard further provides more clarifications when there is variable consideration involved in a contract. Entity will estimate the variable consideration and whenever there are uncertainties in the variable consideration, variable consideration will be included in the transaction price only when there is no significant revenue reversal expected in the future. So there should be some form of certainty of no significant revenue reversals in future. We have gone through three steps now. We have identified the contract, identified the performance obligation and determined the transaction price. Whenever there are multiple performance obligations, that is, when there are multiple goods and services involved in a contract, the total transaction price has to be allocated to each of these performance obligations. So the standard recommends allocation based on standalone selling prices. Whenever standalone selling prices are not observable, then we have to go with an estimate. Estimate could be based on adjusted market assessment approach or it could be based on expected cost plus a margin approach or could also be based on a residual approach but it's only permitted in limited circumstances. What happens when there is a discount? A discount should also be allocated to all the performance obligations. However, there could be certain cases where discount may not be allocated to every performance obligation in a contract. Also, whenever the consideration is paid in advance or when consideration is paid in arrears, an entity has to consider whether there is a significant financing arrangement involved. If there is a financing arrangement, then an entity has to adjust for time value of money. We have now gone through four steps. One, identifying the contract. Two, identifying the performance obligation in the contract. 3. Determining the transaction price 4. Allocating the transaction price to each performance obligation And now we have come to the last step, recognizing revenue Revenue can be recognized when control is passed on Control could be passed on over a period of time or a point in time Control of the asset is ability to direct the use of and obtain substantially all remaining benefits. So control is basically ability to direct the use and also enjoy the benefits. The benefits could be potential cash flows, either direct or indirect. Some of the examples are ability to produce goods, 
or provide services with the asset using this asset to enhance the value of other assets settle liabilities or reduce expenses sell the asset or exchange the asset for something else pledge the asset to borrow a loan and finally just holding the asset we have now gone through the five step framework ifrs 15 also provides guidance on Contract costs. Incremental costs of obtaining a contract should be recognized as an asset if these three conditions are satisfied. These are basically costs that an entity would not have incurred if the contract had not been successfully obtained. Three conditions are 1. They should relate directly to a contract. 2. These costs either generate or these costs enhance resources for satisfying a performance obligation and the costs are expected to be recovered. When these three conditions are satisfied, an entity should recognize these costs as an asset. These costs could include direct labor, direct material or allocation of overheads that relate directly to the contract. An entity, if it chooses to amortize the contract costs, then it should be consistent with the pattern of the transfer of goods. We have come to the end of the video. We briefly went through the five step framework in IFRS 15 for recognizing revenue from contract with customers. This page has got a summary of everything we saw so far in this video. Feel free to pause here and refresh your memory again before jumping to the next video. I've also made some videos on IAS 18 and IFRS 9 some time back. I'll leave the details of those video links in the description. In case you want to check them out, feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Let me know your thoughts. Please like and subscribe.